In this lecture, we are going to discuss um, two topics. Uh, the starting point for both topics is going to be the strain energy per unit area of uh, the strain energy expression for plates and the total potential energy for plates. Um, then we are going to derive the plate equation, which we have already derived through the equilibrium route before, but we will derive it from energy methods. And then, uh, but this time, this time we will derive it together with the boundary conditions. And then after that, we are going to obtain uh, an exact solution for simply supported rectangular plates. And then after that, we will look at the situation where we cannot solve exactly, so we will solve approximately, again starting from the total potential energy of the plate, and this is what is usually called the Rolleridge method, and this would be uh, the content. This would be the contents of the lecture. So the starting topic we're going to need in order to develop everything else is going to be an expression for the total potential energy of plates. Total potential energy. So total potential energy, of course, is composed of the potential energy of internal forces which we call the strain energy, and we use the simple U. So this is strain energy. And V, which is potential energy. And this is due to external, externally applied loads. So potential energy of external applied loads is actually quite easy, so we will concentrate on the strain energy uh, due, to, uh, due to bending of the plate. There are two ways to do that, either from the expression for uh, strain energy in state of plane stress, because we agreed that plates are assumed to be in plane stress. So we can start either from the expression for strain energy in plane stress, or we can start from an expression of virtual work. And I'll use virtual work here. Um, deriving it from energy is also straightforward. So we will start from an expression for the virtual work of internal forces in plane stress. So it is a volume integral of sigma x delta epsilon x plus sigma y delta epsilon y plus tau xy delta gamma xy. And the volume integral, I'm going to integrate first with respect to z, and then with respect to x and y. OK. Now, for plates, we do know that the strains are linear in z. This is the assumption we made based on the kinematics of the plate, and we derived in detail the, these strain energy expressions. The strain expression, sorry. OK, very well. So now, with these, we can substitute for the strains. Remember that delta here is small changes in strain due to small changes in displacement, small virtual changes in displacement. So, and as such, Z is considered a constant as far as the delta is concerned. So we can write 
the work done by internal forces in the following form. Integration with respect to Z is from half thickness below to half thickness above. The first term will involve sigma x z dz delta w x x and because of these minus signs we have a plus here. The reason for that is that w doesn't depend on z so we can pull it out of z integrals. The second term will involve sigma y z dz and the third term will involve tau x y here and then dx dy and these integrals are should be familiar to us by now this is mx this is my this is myx so we can write the virtual work done by internal forces to be integration over the area of the plate of mx delta w comma xx plus my delta w y y plus 2 m y x delta w comma x y dx y and this is the expression of virtual work done by internal forces due to bending and you can see here featuring heavily are the bending uh, stress uh, resultants. Okay, now we can proceed to calculate the mx, my and myx in terms of wxx, wyy, wxy, which we have done in the previous lecture. So we had mx was minus b wxx plus nu wyy, my minus d wyy plus nu wxx and mxy was nothing other than d minus d, 1 minus u, w, x, y. Okay, so now we have these, we can substitute and proceed from there. So we will have w internal equals double integral of d times we will get w x x delta w x x plus w y y delta w y y plus new w y y delta w x x plus w x x 
delta w y y plus two one minus nu w x y delta w x y dx y very well we we know that by definition strain energy is defined to be that the variation of strain energy is minus work done by internal forces the virtual work done by internal forces so we should be able by the way there is a minus sign here of course because of all these minus signs in the definition of the stress resultants so this already gives us an equation for delta u so this will be delta u equals double integral of w d x x delta w x x plus w y y delta w y y plus new w y y delta w x x plus w x x delta w y y plus 2 1 minus u w x y delta w x y this is dx dy very good so now what we need to do is to see what u is and in order to do that it is not difficult to interpret these terms so for example this term is nothing other than delta w x x squared and divided by 2 and the second term is nothing but one half delta w y y squared the two terms we have here are new delta of w x x w y y since they are in multiplication form and the last term is just one minus new delta w x y squared so that's kind of what we have between brackets which we can write it as we can now since everything is uniformly a variation we can pull it out and then from there we can obtain assuming of course new to be constant which is it is because it doesn't depend on w which is the independent variable in this case so we can write delta u to be nothing other than integration of d over 2 we have w x x squared plus w y y squared plus Two new W X X W Y Y plus two one minus new W X Y squared D X D Y and this here is the expression of strain energy. U to bending. All right, very well. Now, what about the other term 
which is which we needed for which we need for the total potential, which is the potential energy of external loads. The only external load we consider now is lateral pressure Q. Note that Z is pointing down. So, if you take a small area of the plate, the applied force at that point is in that direction, and it is equal to Q dx dy. If you multiply this by the virtual displacement at that point, which is delta w, you get the work, virtual work done by the external loads. And by definition, this is your delta V minus delta V. And as such, we get delta V is minus Q delta W dx dy. The loading is assumed to be a dead load. It doesn't depend on displacement, and from that, we can easily pull the delta out of the integral to get that V equals minus Q W dx dy. And this is our potential energy. of the external loads. Very well, so now we have U, we have V, and we are good to go. So you add U plus V, minimize that, and obtain your equilibrium equations. All right, so we have obtained the expression of the total potential energy of the plate. In order to derive equilibrium equations, and boundary conditions. That's the nice thing about energy methods, is that you get not only equilibrium equations, but also boundary conditions. Or what we need to do is to find the solution of delta u plus v equals zero, which is for stable equilibrium is going to be a minimum. And since we're talking about small displacement theory, where the strains are linear in displacement, it's always stable. So this is always going to be a minimum for uh, physical material. Materials. And as such, it becomes just a problem of calculus of variations. Delta U is nothing other than minus work done by internal forces. So you can write this as minus integration of mx delta W xx. plus my delta w y y plus 2 m y x delta w comma x y dx dy minus q delta w dx dy and all these are equal to zero. So we can cancel the minus sign and end up with double integral mx delta w x x plus my delta w y y plus 2 times my x 
delta w comma x y plus q delta w dx dy equals zero and this is our equilibrium equation derived from the expression the of minimum total potential energy or equivalently from the principle of virtual work. These are the same thing. We cannot equate the expression inside to zero mainly because although delta W is arbitrary, it's virtual displacement, we can choose it any way we like, but once we choose delta W we fix automatically its derivative with respect to x, y, x, x, and y, y. So essentially, these terms are not independent from delta w. So in order to find the equilibrium conditions, we need to integrate by parts. And since we have second derivatives, we will integrate by parts twice in order to establish the equilibrium equation and the boundary conditions. The derivation will be carried out for a, a rectangular plate. This is x. This is y. Z. And the extent of the plate along x is a and the extent of the plate along y is b. We will integrate by parts twice and from that derive the equilibrium conditions and the boundary conditions. I'm not going to do the details of the integration by parts since we already have a document online where this derivation is done in detail, so we will just limit ourselves to stating the final result. So, the equilibrium equation itself comes out to be exactly as derived before assuming, of course, that D is constant over the plate. For Q is the applied pressure. And then we also derive boundary conditions. Boundary conditions will be either for edges normal to X, for edges normal to y. So for edges perpendicular to the x-axis, first we have the condition on rotation, which says that either w comma x is zero, which is rotation around y is, is restrained, or mx is zero. So either rotation is restrained or bending moment is zero. The second condition is on displacement itself. Either displacement is restrained or total shear in x direction is zero. And total shear in x direction incidentally is not going to be uh, Qx. It will have two components to it, so let us call total shear V of x is zero. This total shear will contain two components. A component is just Qx, which is the shear resultant, and another component which involves the rate of change of the bending moment with respect to y.
plus an additional term, which is the rate of change of myx with respect to y. And similar conditions will hold for edges which are perpendicular to y. You just replace every x by a corresponding y and every y by the corresponding x. All right, very well. So now we do have our um, equations of equilibrium. And this is a, a partial differential equation, as we see here. And we have boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions will be two boundary condition at each, at each edge. Each one of the two boundary conditions can either be on displacement or rotations or the corresponding force or moment. Very well. So now we need to proceed and specialize to cases where we can actually find an exact solution for such a partial differential equation. Unfortunately, partial differential equations are difficult. In general, there are no ways to find general solutions for partial differential equations. So we will limit ourselves to simple cases for which analytic exact solutions are known. And the most famous solution known for plates is the so-called Navier solution. And Navier considered a plate which is simply supported on all sides. So each, each edge here is simply supported. This means that W is restrained, but rotation is allowed. And this is under some applied lateral pressure, which can be function of X and and why. So let us take a look at the simple support boundary condition. We said that either rotation is fixed or bending moment is zero. In this case, simple support means that rotation is not fixed, so bending moment will have to be zero. So on, on, in the, on this edge, mx is zero. And on this edge, also mx is 0. On this edge, my is 0. And here, my is 0. And w is 0 all over, so we don't need to worry about shear forces. So we have two boundary conditions at every edge. OK, very well. Now let us look at the definition of mx. So let's say we are talking about this edge here, which x equals a. So what we're saying is w at a and y is 0, and that mx at a and y is 0. But since w a and y is 0, we can also, by differentiating twice with respect to y, conclude that w double, the second derivative with respect to y along this line is also 0. We cannot differentiate this with respect to x, because x has already been given a value, but we can certainly differentiate it with respect to y. Very well. mx itself is minus b times w x x plus new w y y. We want to equate this to 0. b is not 0. It's the bending stiffness of the plate. And w y y is already 0 along the edge, not everywhere. Then along the edge, we can conclude that w x x e comma y will be 0. So this tells us that for Navier solution, we will have the partial differential equation never changes. 
regardless, as long as we write it in Cartesian coordinates, of course. And it doesn't even depend on whether the plate is rectangular or triangular or something else. It's equal to Q. And the boundary conditions are for edges which are perpendicular to X. We need to satisfy that W is 0 along the edge. And W X X is, is 0. And for edges which are perpendicular to Y, correspondingly, we will have W equals 0 and w y y equals zero. OK. We have a very nice situation here, because only even derivatives appear in the governing partial differential equation, because we have either fourth order derivatives with respect to x, or fourth order derivatives with respect to y. The mixed derivative is of even order, two times with respect to x, two times with respect to y. And in the boundary conditions, we have conditions on W itself, which is zeroth order derivative. So it is also con may be considered. Uh, it also may be considered uh, even. And W X X and W Y Y. This kind of gave Navier the idea that maybe a sine or cosine would be a suitable, uh, a suitable solution. And why is that? It's very simple, because if you differentiate a sign, you get a cosine. You differentiate again, you get a minus sign. So the final result is proportional to the initial. So if we assume W of the form Then we, we when we substitute that into the differential equation, then we get again a sine series. So or not series. I mean we get again a, the same form, where of course m and n are are integers. Before we kind of motivate why he did, let us just start with a one-dimensional example. So let us take a function w, which is c1 times sine alpha x plus c2 cosine beta x. And we want to satisfy the conditions at x equals 0 function value is 0, and at x equals a, fun function value is 0. Of course, since we, these are sines and cosines, if the function is 0, then second derivative is 0 automatically, because second derivative is proportional to the function. So we can easily see from here that if we want w at 0 to be equal to 0, then we need C2 to be 0. That's very good. If we say that we want W at A equal to 0, then we need C1 sine alpha A to be equal to 0. Of course, if we choose C1 to be 0, we get W itself is identically 0 everywhere, which is a trivial solution, which we're really not interested in. We're much more interested in a in non-trivial solution. And the non-trivial solution we will be looking for is when the sine alpha a will be 0. We do know that sine pi is 0, sine 2 pi is 0, sine 3 pi is 0. So if the angle in the sine, the argument of the sine is a, an integer multiple of pi, 
then the sign will be zero. So essentially, we, now we can set alpha times a to be an integer multiple of pi, and then we get w equals some constant sine m pi x over a, and this would satisfy the boundary conditions. Similarly, sine n pi o y over b will satisfy the boundary conditions in y direction. You multiply together the satisfy boundary conditions in x and y. So this is a good solution. So if we substitute this into the differential equation now, we don't need to worry about the boundary conditions because boundary conditions are already satisfied. This is some sort of an aside. If we substitute, then we get the following. Of course, if you differentiate sine four times, you get a sine again. So the whole thing comes out to be d m pi over a to the power 4 plus 2 m pi over a squared n pi over b squared plus n pi over b to the power 4 a m n and this is our left hand side and this, of course, multiplies, uh, excuse me, a m n, and then we are left with the sine and this is equal to q. Very well. So what this means is that if Q has the form of two signs multiplying each other, then we can easily find a solution. So if Q is of the, of the form A M N sine M pi X over A sine N pi y over b, then we can cancel the signs on both sides of the equation. This is if. Then we can find a relationship between the displacement amplitude and the pressure amplitude. So both of them will look exactly the same. There are just two signs multiplying each other. but the amplitudes will be related by this relationship here and the bracket up we can write it as m pi a squared plus n pi over b squared all squared it's a complete square so and this is the relationship between the sine coefficients of the displacement and the sine coefficients of applied pressure. But what happens if applied pressure is not sinusoidal? What do we do? And what comes to our aid in that case is the idea of a Fourier series. We do know that any function whatsoever can be expanded in terms of either sines alone or cosines alone or combinations of sines and cosines. And as such, if we have a general loading, we can write the loading in the form Q of X and Y is a summation over M and N, some coefficients times sine 
m pi x over a sine n pi y over b. And these coefficients here from the theory of Fourier series are given by the following integral. Okay, now since our problem is linear, then we can apply superposition and say that the response due to the sum is the sum of the individual responses. And we already know how the plate would respond to each term in the series because we have already solved the problem for a single sinusoidal loading. So, W will be again a summation m comma n a m n sine m pi x over a sine n pi y over b where where EMN is given by the equation previously obtained. And as such, the procedure now is to solve problems like this is very simple. Step number one, find the sine coefficients of Q. Yeah? And this is done by straightforward integration. So it's not difficult. To calculate the sine coefficients of the displacement w, which is quite straightforward because it's just algebraic substitution then we can find W. Just by summing the series, if you want W at any point, you just sum enough terms and you evaluate the displacement at that given point. But usually we are not only interested in finding the deformation. In structures we are also interested in finding the stresses. And to find stresses, we can easily find mx, my, and myx by differentiation. And from these, we can find sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy, and these we can use in order to evaluate failure and see if the plate failed or it hasn't failed. So as you can easily see, the procedure is quite straightforward. There is not much there um, in, order, in, in terms of complexity. It's just a matter of integrating to find uh, the coefficients for the load series, the applied pressure series, and just algebraic calculations will tell us the corresponding coefficients in the deflection series, and everything else follows from deflection. Because in plate theory, the main unknown is the vertical displacement W, the lateral displacement, the displacement, the bending displacement, the displacement in the thickness direction. It's only unknown. Once this is known, strains followed by differentiation and stresses and stress resultants followed by simple algebra. So it's very straightforward. We are going to solve a couple of examples to show how this applies in practice. And then 
move on to our last topic, which is what to do if we can't find an exact solution like this, because this is a very restrictive case in terms of both geometry and boundary conditions. So now let us take a look at the calculation of the uh, pressure coefficients because this is really the most important step in the Navier solution. We will consider two simple cases. The first case we're going to consider is the case of uniform pressure. Q naught. And in this case, we can calculate AMN is integration from 0 to B, integration from 0 to A. Q0 is constant, so we can pull it out of the integral. So we would have sine M pi x over A dx. And we can pull out sine n pi y over b dy. But now this integral here is constant with respect to y, so we can easily end up writing this as q naught integration from 0 to a sine m pi x over a dx times integration 0 to b sine n pi y over b dy. So this is really nice because these are easy integrals to do, one dimensional. We don't have to do something fancy. Um, for the double integrals. So we evaluate this one and then similarly we evaluate this one since these two integrals look pretty much the same. So the first integral The integration of sine is minus cosine. And in order to get a coefficient of 1, we have to divide by the coefficient of x inside the cosine. So we have a over n pi. And this will go from oh. There is a 4 over AB in the definition here, sorry. We will go from 0 to A. All right. So this means that we substitute x equal A, and then substitute x equal 0, and subtract. If we substitute x equal A, we get minus A over or m pi cosine m pi. Remember that m is an integer. Minus, if we substitute 0, we get minus a over m pi. So minus minus is plus. So we get a over m pi. From here, we get this is equal to a over m pi times 1 minus q sine m pi, which is fairly straightforward, but we can simplify it even further. If m is 0, q sine 0 is 1, and as such, the integration comes down to 1 minus 1 is 0. If m is 1, cosine pi is minus 1, so we end up with 2 
in the bracket, so the integration is 2a over m pi. If m is 3, we get cosine 3 pi, which is minus 1. If it is 2, it is cosine 2 pi, which is 1. So you can easily see that the result is going to be always 0 if m is even. And it will be a non-zero, namely 2a over m pi when m is odd. Of course, this makes sense because if you think about sine m pi x over a, I'm going to sketch it here. If m is 1, you get half a wave, which is symmetric. If m is 2, you get two waves, two half waves, which is anti-symmetric, and then 3, again, symmetric, 4, anti-symmetric, and so forth and so on. And since our loading is symmetric, it does make sense that all even terms, which correspond to anti-symmetric shapes, would be 0. All right, so same goes for um, the other integral. We just replace a by b and n by uh, an m by n. So from here, we can easily find that a m n would be equal to 16 q naught over pi squared m n. And this is when m and n are, are odd. And 0 otherwise. So now we have the load coefficients. We can straightforward substitute to find the displacement coefficients and find the displacement distribution. This is already an example that's solved in the book, so you can check it there in chapter 7. The second example we're going to solve is going to be the case of a concentrated force. So this is our plate now, and halfway through the plate, we are going to stick a concentrated load P. And we want to find the load series corresponding to P. Of course, Navier solution works with pressure distribution, meaning force per unit area. So it cannot work with a concentrated load. Many people say, oh, we replace P by a delta, a direct delta function, which is correct, except that it is good to keep in mind first what a delta function is, so that when you express loading in terms of delta function, then you know what you're doing. So let us first discuss what a delta function is. Let's say we have a function of a variable called x, and we want to plot our delta function. Delta function, mathematicians don't call it a function, really, because the way it is defined, it is defined in terms of a limiting process. What you do is you say that I have a function which is non-zero only between epsilon over 2 and minus epsilon over 2. And the value of the function over that interval is 1 over epsilon. The idea here is that the total area underneath is always equal to 1, because the base 
is of length epsilon, the height is 1 over epsilon, you multiply, you get 1. And then delta function is obtained by taking the limit as epsilon goes to 0. That's why people always say, oh, it is 0 everywhere except infinity at 0, but this is not really a good way because infinity is not a very well-defined number, actually. So it is actually a limiting process. So what you do is you take a, a hatch function, which is non-zero only over one interval. The interval is centered around zero, and the total area is equal to one. You take the limit as the width of the intervals become, interval becomes very small, and the height is too, lar is too high, too large. And then, but keeping the area constant and equal to 1. And this is the definition of delta of x, which is Dirac's function. And of course, if we want to center it around a different point, so for example, if you want to center it around 1, you calculate delta x minus 1. If you want to center it around x equal 10, you work with delta x minus 10. So, what is the main property of um, of our delta function? The main property we're going to use is what's called the sifting property. That if you pick any function of x and get multiplied by delta function and integrate with respect to x over an interval that includes x naught, which is the location of the delta function, then the result is going to be the value of the function f at x naught. And this is really what makes integrations involving delta function very easy. You just substitute a value and you're done. There is no real integration involved. Okay. So we can easily think why delta functions are related to concentrated forces. Because it's, it's the same idea. Concentrated force, we can always think about as a finite pressure acting on a finite area but then squeezing the area to go to zero, and then the pressure will go to infinity if we want to keep the net force the same. So pretty much the same case. So what you do is you replace that concentrated force by a uniform pressure over a small area centered around the point of application of the force of width epsilon in y direction and epsilon in x direction. And then the area is epsilon squared. If you want the total force to be equal to p, then you have to choose q equals 1 over epsilon squared. So what you want to do is to define q of x, y equals 1 over epsilon squared, where when x is between x naught plus epsilon over 2 and x naught minus epsilon over 2, where x naught is the location of the application of the force and y correspondingly between y naught minus epsilon over 2 and y naught plus epsilon over 2 and 0 elsewhere and you can multiply by p outside. So this pressure distribution will always have a net resultant equal to the force p and we make that force concentrated at the limit when we take epsilon to zero. Very well. So we can write this now 
as q x y equals p times one over epsilon if x because this is an end so both x and y should be in that square so we can write it one over epsilon x between x naught plus epsilon over two and x naught minus epsilon naught over two else otherwise and then we multiply this by one over epsilon when y is between y naught plus epsilon over two and y naught minus epsilon over two zero else. But this is nothing in the limit other than delta x minus x naught. And this is nothing in the limit other than delta y minus y naught. So if we want to represent our concentrated force applied at a point x naught and y naught, we write q equals p, which is the magnitude of the force, delta x minus x naught, delta y minus y naught. And that's very easy, because now our coefficients are so easily obtained x dy and again we have a function of x multiplying a function of y so this is 4p over a b integration from 0 to a sine m pi x over a delta x minus x naught dx multiplying integration from 0 to b sine n by y over b delta y minus y naught ui and by the property of the delta function we obtain amn equals 4p over ab sine m by x naught over a sine n by y naught over b. Of course, if you compare what we have here with what we had with uniform pressure, for uniform pressure, the coefficients were inversely proportional to the product m n which meant that as m and n kept growing, these coefficients went to zero. So the series converse. But here, these coefficients don't go to zero as m and n go to, to infinity because they are pretty much always order one because they are just signs and that's it. Sign is always between minus one and one it doesn't die off or anything. So as you can easily see here that this series will not be convergent. But this is the series for load. If you look at AMN, which is the coefficients of the series of displacement, we are AMN over B M pi over A squared plus n pi over b squared all squared. So essentially what we have here is these integers to the power 4 in the denominator 
So even AMN series doesn't go to zero, but AMN will go to zero very fast. Not as fast as the case of uniform pressure, but it will go to zero, and as such, we will be able to find a meaningful solution for displacements, although that the load series is not is not convergent. Yeah, so this pretty much finishes our discussion of Navier solution. Uh, and we move on to the next uh, part of the lecture, which is the Raleigh-Ridge method.